Hey everybody, welcome to sustainability, the principles of sustainability actually, uh, NatSci 112. Uh, my name is Brett Ketter, I was kind of handed this at the last second. Uh, so some of the information in here, I've, a little bit foreign to me, but I have a background in geology. My bachelor's degree is in geology from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and I have a master's degree in uh, seismology or earthquakes. Um, I'm the guy you see on TV if there's like notable earthquakes that the press wants to come see down at UWM. And for the last uh, 10 years, 12 years, I've been teaching what's called GIS as well, um, which is my main job now. Um, that's what the little GISP is after my name. I'm a GIS certified professional. Um, but you kind of never give up your geological roots, so to speak. So the reason I'm able to teach this class is because my background allows me to you know, because I understand the concepts of what's going on here. I just got to refresh myself on a lot of them. I've been doing a lot of reading and everything. Um, I hope that we can have some fun this semester, given the fact that, you know, this has been put as an online only course. And, um, you know, looking through the syllabus, uh, I've just, I, I was handed a syllabus by another gentleman who runs this class. I made a few little odd changes, but other than that, I'm just going to keep the same format mainly because they handed me this class so late. I want to get going. So we will make do with the best we can, okay? And just know that, you know, please have patience with, we, with me and I will absolutely have patience with you. Um, if anything comes up in terms of we're running late on anything, I will always push deadlines out. I will never shorten them up. Uh, I will always give you, you know, the benefit of the doubt in terms of, you know, okay, if we can't take the quiz today, I'll extend it another day or two just so we can all get it done. So I'm never going to try to screw you over that way. Uh, I want to make sure that, it, you know, everybody's got a fair and uh, solid back, uh, baseline for what we're going to do. So what we are going to do is we're going to talk about sustainability. And in chapter one, if you look at the book that, uh, for the book, hopefully you get the book soon if you don't already have it. Um, is it the best book in the world? No, but you know what? There's really not too many sustainability books. This is not, let me let me step back a second. This is not environmental science. This is sustainability. Now they are parallel to each other, but sustainability comes into a lot of, not only understanding uh, what it is, and we'll talk about what sustainability is, but how to perpetuate it in terms of policy, decision-making, things like that, initiatives, who's doing what, where, you know, who's responsible. So there's a lot of that sort of involved with sustainability as opposed to just environmental science where we talk about the water cycle or the rock cycle or the soil cycle or all these other cycles. We'll touch on all of that in this course along with some of the big topics like climate change and things like that. But sustainability is its sort of own beast in the sense that, again, it's almost like a mindset in terms of uh, what you could do to go forward. We'll we're gonna talk about that all semester, but chapter one is just kind of looking at the basics. So welcome to sustainability. All right, so there isn't a perfect definition for sustainability, but here's a really good one. Sustainability is living within the bounds of nature based on renewable resources used in ways that won't deplete non-renewable resources, harm essential ecological services, or limit the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Whew, that's a mouthful, right? So I'm sure you've heard some of this stuff before. I mean, we all recycle, right? You have a recycle bin at your house or you, know, you have to separate your aluminum cans and plastics from your garbage. That's a small decision that that's a decision that was made to play a, a small role in a much bigger picture of this sustainability to look at not just what's happening now, but what's going on in the what's going to happen in the future. And you could see that based on renewable resources, we're going to talk about renewable and non renewable resources in a bit. But just know that renewable resources are just that they can be used again and again and again, right? We aluminum cans, for example. Uh, a, a really easy one is sunlight. Sunlight is always renewable. The sun comes up every 12 hours or whatever it is. All right. We don't want to deplete our non-renewable resources. So we want to kind of figure out ways to get off of those, like fossil fuels, certain mineral types, things like that. Because, you know, the earth only has so much 
that it has, you know, to bear. So you have to be able to, um, you know, try to step back from that to slow the extraction of it by utilizing non-renewable sources. And again, we're going to talk about all this in much more detail as we go. Or harm essential ecological services. Well, what does that mean? Well, ecological services are basically sort of those building blocks of how habitats are formed. In it could be biodiversity, you know, all different kinds of critters. We don't. We want to avoid things like invasive species, which we'll talk about later. Um, all of these types of things where you want to try to keep the status quo or keep what's already there as natural as possible without any influence on man. And that's hard to do, obviously, nowadays with industry and, you know, cars and all of this stuff, that, you know, and garbage. We're going to talk about all this stuff this semester. And then, obviously, the last part of that is limit the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We don't want to limit that. What that means is, so for my children's children's children, there's still plenty of renewable resources and maybe even some non-renewable resources left. So that's what that means. We want to make these decisions now and get things sort of turned around and get away from the non-renewable parts for future generations. So that's sort of what sustainability is in a nutshell. Like I mentioned earlier, sustainable is not necessarily an environmental science term. It's used in all kinds of uh, aspects in life. For example, it's used in business and sports, and it's. But the sort of the 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 meaning behind it is similar. Capable of being continued indefinitely. That's sustainable. That's sort of its official definition, and that's essentially what we're looking at, but on a much bigger scale. Let's say a global scale where there's many different facets and things coming into that that allow uh, that of decisions that need to be made that allow you to maintain that sustainable um, sustainability, excuse me. So sustainable is used a lot, capable of being continued. That's what we're looking at just on a much larger scale. So there is a very brief sort of history, I guess. Um, but you know, this goes way back in terms of, you know, for example, the native peoples, you know, the native Americans here, they were, they were pros at this, at sustainable practices. They understood that if you over hunted, you'd have nothing left to hunt. If you over fished, you'd have no fish left. They understood this, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago. And they, that's why they thrived for so long. It wasn't until later on that, you know, we started to see these patterns where consumption grew so much that all of a sudden things like um, fisheries and stuff like that, all of these types of um, uh, crops or, you know, uh, that we need, we want as humans start to deplete because they're being overconsumed. All right. So here's an example. Back in 1769, the governor of uh, Mauritania or Mor Mauritanius, <laughs> I forgot how to pronounce that, set aside 25 percent of the island to help uh, the declining of the dodo. Well, they tried. Unfortunately, the dodo did go extinct. Right. Hopefully, you know that the dodo was an old, a bird that was around all over the place and they their habitat just got shrunk to nothing and they ended up going extinct. All right, so there are no more dodo on planet Earth. Now, there was a whole bunch of people in, in the United States that sort of started this, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but um, the people like President Teddy Roosevelt, who set aside huge tracts of land, which we now know as national parks, the first being Yellowstone, okay? and national monuments and national forests and putting aside all of these to keep them for future generations. All right, and there's other facets that play a role in that as well, but that's a huge part of it that these people saw that this has to be protected now, not later when it's too late. Now there's solutions for sustainability all over the place. All right, and there's many, many ways of trying to do this, and we're going to talk about this. It's essentially what this whole class talks about. What can be done? What solutions can be forged 
to help build a more sustainable planet Earth. So things like renewable resources, soil conservation, pollution reduction, habitat and species protection, protection, excuse me, recycling, and then, you know, the big one, fighting global climate change, which is, you know, that's no easy topic to cover, okay? So all of these solutions, or, or excuse me, all of these, these play a role in trying to create a sustainable earth, all right? And the problem is, is a lot of this becomes site-specific, political, you know, religious. I mean, you can go on and on. Um, you know, there might be some native tribal people that just, they don't understand this stuff and they've been doing it their way and they're not going to change, even though it might be detrimental to the environment. So there, this is easier said than done, but there's many people out there trying to get these things done. There are solutions. They're just tough ones. <laughs> All right, let's take a, 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 some, a look at some of these pictures. So we have four pictures here. The upper left one, hopefully you recognize those. The, those are the Maui from Easter Island, those big uh, uh, stone heads that you've probably seen all over the place. All right, the upper right is a settlement in Greenland, the big uh, big island of Greenland way up in the north. And the bottom two represent both a, uh, a silt, you know, like a, um, a soil storm on the left and then showing a farmer on the right uh, doing what's called uh, deep furrow plowing which eventually caused what's the Dust Bowl of the 1930s here in America. So let's take a little bit closer to that. So if you look at Greenland, if you read this whole thing in a nutshell, Greenland was never really green. It was more of a marketing ploy. But what did happen there is because enough people started to settle there, they pretty much wiped out all the trees. So there's really no trees left in Greenland because they've been deforested, all right? So the green part of it was to get people to go there as a marketing ploy. But unfortunately, it was uh, forest. There are no forests left because of uh, people trying to build their homes and settle there. The Easter Island one is kind of a weird site because there are remnants of forests, even though the entire island is virtually treeless. So they've probably it was, again, probably one of those things where they needed the wood they they consumed more than they planted and all of a sudden there's no trees anymore okay we're not going to go into the cannibalism thing that's you know I don't, I don't even know if that's true or not so but the point is is it's another one of those instances where the the habit habitants of that island didn't create a sus sustainable environment they essentially wiped themselves out by deforesting the entire island and finally, we have the plowing that eventually led to the Dust Bowl. Okay, so there was a drought. However, the farming practices back then were much different in terms of how they handled the soil and then the deep, you know, plowing too deep and uprooting, you know, do, uh, messing up the roots and things like that. And eventually what happened is that a combination of all those things created what's called the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And it was, it devastated much of the Midwest, you know, across, you know, our uh, Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska, just devastated them um, because the they didn't understand the best practices for farming where you might leave one field fallow, which means just don't even mess with it. Let those nutrients build back up. They just kept plowing and plowing and plowing and plowing to the point where there's, and then on top of that with the drought, you had basically a situation where the 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 uh, the topsoil just became sand or dust, hence the dust bowl. And it would kick up with all these winds. There's a lot of winds out on the high plains like that, out of the plains. You kick up these winds and create these massive dust storms that like you see in the in the picture in the lower left. So it again, we know better now, but you can always do better. There's better farming practices. There's more, um, there's better seeding practices and irrigation, but more can be done still to get at a point where you're, you're doing very little damage to anything. You can't talk about sustainability without talking about natural resources and the environmental issues that go with them. 
So we have what are called ubiquitous resources, which means that they can be found everywhere. Things like sunlight, water, and air, right? We, you see those every day in some form or fashion, whether either it's coming from your sink, you look up in the sky, you're obviously breathing air, otherwise, okay? And then those are everywhere. And then other ones such as like minerals are much more localized. You can only find gold in very specific environments. Okay, you can only find lead or diamonds in very specific rock types and very sp specific environments. But, you know, sunlight, water and air are everywhere. So we have two main types of resources. Okay, we have what are called biotic and abiotic. Now, biotic ones are living things. They're living, uh, they're derived from living organisms and or, or, or organic matter. So things like forests, trees, animals, um, even fossil fuels, because fossil fuels are derived from, you know, dead plants and that over millions of years, okay? Natural gas, which is a byproduct, okay? So all of those things are biotic. They're, they somehow have been generated either by living or organic matter in some form or fashion. And then you have not abiotic, which means non-living things like water, minerals, metals, and air. Okay, they don't. There's nothing living in those. So those are the two sort of main groups of of resources that we're going to talk about. Now, the, hopefully, you can see right away that looking at that list, okay, that renewable resources are found in both kinds, right? So, and we'll talk more about this later, but you know. Forests are renewable. You can plant more trees, and that's biotic. Sunlight, water, and air are all abiotic, but they are also renewable, right? We have solar solar panels, you know, uh, wind farms, and hydroelectric dams, kind of thing. So the, even though they're non-living things, they are still renewable. So if you go, if you know anything about physics, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but Physics has this uh, a law that states that matter can be neither created nor destroyed, okay? And because of this, matter cycles through different types of um, stages, okay? So if you take, uh, let me think about it. If you take, we'll look at oil, right? So you take a, a swamp, that swamp is covered over by something, it's pushed down, it's Re, it's heated to high temperatures, it's under high pressures, it's buried over millions of millions of years, all of a sudden, boom, you get oil. But that particular cycle takes, like I said, millions of years, whereas other cycles could be fairly quick, at least on a human scale, you know, maybe hundreds of years for certain types of trees, or millions of years, like I mentioned, for the oil. So these cycles like this, have a tendency, you know, to dictate what is and what isn't renewable, right? If you can't get it within a, you know, a lifetime or maybe a couple lifetimes, it's going to be awfully hard to keep up um, production of that with the consumption you're getting. That's why I always talk about we're going to run out of oil. Well, oil takes millions of years, right? And we've already sucked up a ton of it in the last 100, 150 years. So, you know, who knows how much oil is going to be left because it's, it takes millions of years to create it. So when looking at the natural resources, we have several different sort of distinctions. So the first one's called inexhaustible resources, those that cannot be used up. And a perfect example of that is sunlight. Sun's always there. Well, not during nighttime, but, you know, it comes up the next day. It's there. That's why we use solar power. Um, in terms of, you know, trying to get ourselves away from, let's say, fossil fuels. You have those renewable resources that can be replaced, but it might take a while, things like timber, you know, for uh, trees and soil. Yes, soil is a renewable resource and it needs to be taken care of because otherwise you get things like the Dust Bowl, like I mentioned earlier. Then you have those non-renewable uh, resources, which are consumed faster than they can be replenished such as coal, oil, natural gas. Uh, that makes sense, right? The, because therefore those take millions of years to form and we're just sucking them out of the ground as fast as we can. And then you have recyclable non-renewable resources. And you've seen this stuff before, things like iron, aluminum, and copper. You know, we take, we 
separate our cans and steel and copper and things like that. And you know, copper is worth quite a bit right now. People people take it in to get some cash for it. But those are th at least three really good examples of recyclable materials that can be used over and over and over again. So natural resources are vital to our survival and, and we use them in every way, shape and form, right? We use them for uh, our everyday lives, right? From our cell phones, which contain, you know, very rare metals, if you if you go into the chemistry of it, to the water that comes out of our sink, to the gas we put in our car, everything we do revolves around natural resources, right? However, you know, again, going back and trying to understand that if we could shift ourselves from maybe the right side of this back over to the left where you have more renewable resources, you know, you start to understand why there's been a push for this because, you know, the environment's taken such a beating from the fossil fuels that we want to get away from those and start using sunlight, wind, wave, and geothermal. Now, not every place has geothermal. If you don't know what geothermal is, it's an area that has an abnormal amount of heat that's being pumped up from within the earth near the surface. A perfect example is Iceland. Iceland sits right on what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So it's literally be being pulled apart by two different, because of being on two different plates. And because of that, you get everything that goes with it because this, the, the, the crust of the earth is very thin right there. So you get things like volcanoes, you get little, little volcanoes like cinder cones, but you also get geysers right? Like Old Faithful and Yellowstone, which spouts water up. They have these huge hot baths there, some of the biggest in the world, where it's being heated from below. And this water is not, it's its pretty warm, almost to the point of, you know, you got to be very careful getting in there. And it's full of minerals and people think it has all these medicinal purposes. But the point is, is that heat's coming from up underneath. You can trap that and use the steam that's coming off of that to then turn generators and create electricity, which Iceland does quite a bit. So it's using the natural properties of its own country to generate some of its electricity rather than using coal or you know, uh, oil type stuff. So, and again, I've already mentioned the renewable, you know, being, being able to perpetuate themselves, sunlight, wind and wave, um, and then shorter periods of time with, uh, with the, the trees and water and soil, and then obviously non-renewable. So the idea is to try to, you know, get the sustainability part of that is always trying to get further and further away from the non-renewable towards the renewable to become more sustainable. And that's where that word's always going to come in is go back to that slide, like the second or third slide where you're able to do it indefinitely. Sustainability, being able to keep doing something over and over again and sustain it. So <clears throat> when we're looking at uh, natural resources, two of the most important ones that we sometimes take for granted is air and water. And air is everywhere, right? We breathe it, we have to breathe it. <laughs> and uh, about 600 quarts of oxygen a daily, according to the the slide here and then on top of that you have the oxygen carbon dioxide cycle which is you know essential to life on earth that is we breathe in oxygen we expel out of our mouth carbon dioxide that carbon dioxide is then taken by plants and then through photosynthesis takes the carbon dioxide and expels oxygen so it's a constant cycle which is like i said absolutely vital to life on earth for us humans. Um, and it also now serves as a other function like, uh, you know, windmills, you know, there's a lot more windmills being put up for to generate power. Um, is it perfect? No, in the sense that, uh, you know, some people still look at them as eyesores and there's <clears throat> bird migration issues and stuff, but you know, it is a clean power source and uh, they're not going anywhere and they've been putting more and more of them up over time. The other one that we talk about and we all see every day, we take showers, you know, run water. Uh, you know, water is a vital, vital <laughs> to our, our our livelihoods in terms of we must have it to live. And uh, we need it for agriculture. We need it for plants and animals. However, you know, with with 
populations getting so you know 7.3 billion people on earth now um you know there there's going to be a point where uh you know water is going to be a precious it, it already is a precious resource but if you look at the the number on the screen there it says 2.5 percent of all the water on earth is fresh water and most of that is sucked up by glaciers and uh the polar ice caps so there's only a small fraction of fresh water that's available to us to use here in wisconsin you know we live right on one of the great lakes but there's other parts of the country and obviously other parts of the world where that's not the case we're a bit spoiled that way here and then you take that water and unfortunately especially in developing countries you have things like uh where you have widespread pollution uh things like raw sewage being dumped into the same water stream where you're getting your drinking water from which is really disgusting when you think about it but that actually happens in other areas of the world where po you know a lot of poverty and things like that so you know air and water are vital to our our, our lives we need it to live <laughs> but they're also hugely beneficial for um, a lot of things in terms of sustainability and, uh, for like renewable energy sources, hydroelectric dams for water, and then obviously windmills for uh, air. So very, very um, underappreciated maybe a little because we, we take them for granted, but uh, hugely important. So if you look at a sort of a pie slice of how the energy breaks down, this is from 2018 here. Um, you can see, still see that the fossil fuels dominate the pie. So you have petroleum at 36%, which is the largest slice of the pie, and natural gas at 31. Now, natural gas is still a fossil fuel because it's a it's a byproduct of the oil. Um, they're found usually together, and uh, so you know having 30, although it's a much cleaner option than let's say oils and stuff like that. It's a bit cleaner. Um, it's still a fossil fuel and non-renewable, all right? And then you have coal, which is, you know, uh, probably at one time was a bigger slice of the pie, but it's 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 gotten smaller because of, obviously, petroleum. And then you can see the renewable resources sort of broken down there in terms of what's being used. Now, geothermal is obviously the smallest there at the top of that, at the top of the, uh, the pie chart thing here. Let's see if I can highlight this. So, oh, not that. So this tiny little sliver up here is geothermal. Well, you know, the problem with geothermal is it, it works, it does, but you, you know, it's only in very select areas of the country. So not a lot of places have geothermal capabilities. Solar is another thing, you know, solar, the uh, solar panels work, but the problem is, is they don't work as efficiently as other types of renewal, renewable energy because uh, the photoelectric cells are still not at that point yet where they can generate without having you know entire valleys full of those things you've seen those probably in the desert um, and then you have wind which is becoming a very very uh, huge uh, part of the renewable energy pie slice i'm sure that's only going to grow because you know this country especially the middle section of the country has lots of wind you know, the Great Plains generates so much wind because all the, the air coming down off the Rockies. It's always windy out in Kansas, Nebraska, and all those places. So that 22% that is only going to grow from there. And as the, uh, the, wind, the windmills get better and, you know, maybe the, <laughs> the, uh, the attitude towards them changes, they'll get more and more uh, popular, so to speak. Uh, I have, you might have seen pictures of it in other books, but I have actually seen the big, massive windmill farm out in California. It's huge. I mean, it's as far as you can see, but nothing but windmills. But they also have like, you know, 30 million people or whatever it is, 4 million people in the LA Basin area. I forgot what it is. 8 million? No, I think it's 8 million. Um, a lot of people. So they need a lot of energy. And you can see down at the bottom here, the hydroelectric. Again, those are dams where they regulate the water that flows through the dam, which turns engines, turbines, which creates steam, which creates um, electricity. So, um, and then wood is still here. Wood is renewable, 
Um, and it is used in some areas. Obviously, if you don't have trees, it's kind of hard to use wood. So that, that's one of those things. A lot of these renewable sources are based upon, you know, the availability of what you have. If you're, you know, out in the middle of Iowa with cornfields, you're not going to have a whole lot of wood. Um, whereas in Oregon, Washington, and, you know, the, a lot of the upper tier states like us, we have Northwood states. We have tons and tons of trees and the ability to replant them all the time. So you can see that, you know, this this pie chart hasn't changed a ton. However, it you know, over time, I can see this renewable energy one getting bigger. Um, nuclear is not going to ever get super big because of the uh, risks involved with um, not not only, uh, you know, having an, a nuclear reactor, but, you know, obviously this, the the uh, storage of the waste byproducts is you know obviously a huge concern um, so I don't see that one getting much bigger now another uh, very very important thing is taking care of our land resources again we take this for granted and now if unless if you're a farmer if you're a farmer I'm sure you understand and appreciate the soil, because the soil itself is what gives you your entire, you know, livelihood, and it's what makes your money and everything else. So they, I'm sure, they're very well in tune with it. However, however, us non-farmers, you know, we have a tendency to, oh, it's dirt. We take it for granted, right? Well, unless if we want another dust bowl situation, those, you know, the the soil has to be taken care of. You know, you want to sometimes not plant it, you know, leave, the term is fallow, leave that particular field fallow for a while, um, you know, for a year, a season, I guess you'd call it, and then plant something else or rotate crops so you're not always using the same crops. They do that as well. Um, and But another issue that sometimes cut crops up, no pun intended, is <laughs> irrigation. So, you know, they use a lot of water too, and that water is usually pumped from underground. So there's a massive, massive um, groundwater system under the middle part of the country, the Ogallala, it's called Ogallala um, uh, Aquifer. And so th those things have to be tended as well. I mean, if you over pump them, you're going to run into trouble. You'll have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper to get more and more fresh water. So the, all of these things play a role that you have to make sure you sustain. And that's where that word comes in. So we can use it indefinitely. You, uh, you know, fertilizing what you need, not fertilizing, rotating crops, just not planting at all for a part of us or a whole season, just to allow the crop, you know, the, the, the fields to sort of regenerate themselves. So all of these things play a huge role in maintaining our land resources, which again, that's where we get all of our crops from, right? Corn, wheat, <laughs> soybeans, everything comes from the ground pretty much. Another huge issue that, you know, unfortunately is a big problem is something called deforestation. And all that means is where you chop down way more trees with, you're clearing land, so it's clear cutting. This isn't chopping down trees for wood. This is chopping down trees, moving all the wood out, maybe using it, but then planting crops there. Those trees, especially, especially in like the Amazon rainforest, are vital to Earth's entire, you know, uh, bio biotic system. Um, <clears throat> much of the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere is sucked up by the Amazon rainforest. There's so much vegetation there; it really eats up a lot of that that uh, um, carbon dioxide and turns it into oxygen. Without that, the carbon dioxide levels would go way up. That's a greenhouse gas, which means, you know, that plays a role into climate change as well. In addition to things like fossil fuels, so does deforestation because you need all those trees, all of that, that uh, greenery to help filter out the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So th there's a lot of reasons why this is done. Like I said, it could be for just planting crops, dams, canals, highways, you know, for firewood. Usually with that kind of thing, uh, the regulations are such that you have to replant, but not always and not everywhere in the world does that. And then mining, you know, if you got to get to some place to mine it. Um, so there's a lot of things 
going on here. And the biggest though is, you know, these people in the Amazon rainforest, they just want to live. So they cut down a bunch of trees, get all that stuff out of the way so they can plant crops. And they don't sometimes don't even realize the damage they're doing. All right, so we can't talk about sustainability without talking at least a little bit about climate change. Now, this is a very, very shallow version of this. We'll go into this more later in the semester, but you know, we have to talk about it. Uh, you know, in a sustainability class, especially because it's a huge part of getting your head wrapped around the fact that if we don't make changes, if we don't become more sustainable, this is only going to get worse. All right, so first let's differentiate between what climate is and what weather is. So climate is an established pattern over a long period of time. So going back as far as the weather records go and seeing trends that are taking place, you know, globally or especially, you know, in the, when it comes to climate change, it is globally, but sometimes just over a region. The weather is just what happens over, you know, the daily variations over a course of a day, maybe a week, you know. So, <laughs> you know, if we, we get a couple hot days in a row, that doesn't mean we have global, you know, clim climate change. It just means it's summer and, you might get in a, a day here and there that's abnormally warm or let's say abnormally cold. And that's gonna happen, those daily fluctuations like that. But just because you have an abnormally cold day in July doesn't mean, you know, it's global cooling. And just like, you know, if you had a warm day in December, it doesn't mean it's global warming. It's just, you know, you gotta look at the trends over a long period of time. So here is a, a chart that I found online looking at, you know, sort of those weather patterns, the temperature patterns going pretty, all the way back to 1880. So there's a, you know, almost 200 years here, or not quite 200 years, but uh, of weather data. And you can see that starting around 1960 or so, the average trend was going up. Now you can see there's a lot of fluctuations there with the blue line, but overall the trend is going up with with the uh, temperature. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of CO2 going up as well, creating this greenhouse gas effect, which we'll talk about in a second. So global variations or global temperatures show large variations, okay? That could be seasonal, it could be a lot of things, but the overall trend, okay? You could see the overall trend is going up along with the amount of, um, uh, carbon dioxide. So this slide here shows you sort of how greenhouse get effect takes place. So you have incoming rays from the sun and this, the, the, the atmosphere around earth is designed to filter out certain things and allow certain things through. So some of the, the, the sun's rays, some of the worst stuff bounces right off the atmosphere and right back into space. Otherwise we'd be a lot hotter if it didn't have that. Some of it gets transmitted through this, the atmosphere, and and is a lot of it is absorbed by the land or or, or the you know the oceans. It just kind of sucks up that energy. Some of it gets at, gets sucked up, and then some of it gets pushed back out towards space. The problem is, is some of these gases re-emit, and once they hit this greenhouse gas layer, right here, it bounces back towards Earth. Okay, and that's where the problem lies. It's sort of trapping in the heat. Okay, that's why they call it a greenhouse effect. So if you've ever been to a greenhouse, even in the middle of winter, as long as there's enough sunlight, those things get pretty warm. You know, the, the, the light comes through the glass, the glass traps that energy in there, traps that heat in there and doesn't allow it to get back out. So that's why they use greenhouses to, you know, plant, uh, um, make plants and stuff like that even in the winter because you can keep the heat up in those things and you know allow it allows you to grow things year round well that's great for plants you know doing that but the problem is is again this is where the global change in climate starts to come in when we have too much of these greenhouse gases too much of it's getting trapped and not being allowed to bounce back out into space, which raises the global temperatures, which causes all kinds of issues like sea level rise and polarized cat melting and 
um, a lot of other things that, you know, again, we'll talk more about this stuff later in the semester. But just understand that the greenhouse gases are what's keeping the heat between us and the atmosphere, making the, the global temperatures rise by a few degrees over the last like 50 years. So what are the main greenhouse gases? Well, by far the most, the biggest one is carbon dioxide. I mean, that comes from many sources. You know, obviously that's what we exhale, exhale when we breathe. But um, the biggest one is, you know, fossil fuels. So your cars, factories, generators, any, everything expels carbon dioxide. And then going back to the slide with the deforestation, if you take away the trees that would normally filter that out, you can see that, you know, it's a snowball effect. You take away the trees, the, the greenhouse gases build up, temperature goes up. If we were to keep the trees, lower <clears throat> the carbon dioxide levels, the greenhouse gases become less of an issue and therefore the temper the global temperatures would probably stabilize. Another one of the greenhouse gases is methane. Now we don't think about methane too much and it's only 9% of the, but it is an issue and it's something that gets brought up um, every once in a while and that's from cows. You know, cows tooting all the time. So there's a lot of cows, there's billions of cows and those cows emit a lot of methane. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, that's what it is. And um, then the other one is nitrous oxide, which is a, another small part of it, um, <clears throat> but it's probably the most dangerous because it hangs up in the atmosphere and can come down as what's called acid rain, which we don't hear about as much, but it's still there. All right, so that, you know, that's something we definitely, definitely want to make sure that uh, you <laughs> we don't have happen. And um, there's much more stringent rules upon uh, on what can be admitted into the atmosphere. So I don't think that one's as prevalent. It's been minimized quite a bit, but it is still there. And that's only in the US I'm speaking of. You go to other parts of the world and they don't have the same regulations. So they might just be pumping this stuff into the atmosphere. You know, you see those factories in Russia and uh, China and stuff like that. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna change topics a little bit. Like I said, we're gonna talk more about <laughs> global warming and climate change uh, later in the semester. Another problem that arises with sustainability is the uh, either unintended or intended <laughs> um, addition of invasive, invasive species and then the value of biodiversity. And I'll explain this as we go. But sometimes when you're trying to take care of one problem, you create another, the law of unintended consequences. Um, and I'm sure we've all been there, done that in life where we thought we did one thing and only made it worse. And that's essentially what this is. So invasive species are something that is either intentionally or unintentionally introduced to a habitat where it spreads like wildfire. It has no natural predators. And you can see some of these around the Great Lakes. These aren't even all of them. Um, a lot of the Great Lakes invasive species came from things like ballast water. So when ships come in from the St. Lawrence Seaway in uh, Canada, they travel through all the locks and they can get all the way through all the Great Lakes into, you know, and they have water stored in their tanks to keep themselves neutrally buoyant. And sometimes they have to release that water in order to, let's say, raise or lower themselves in, in the water column. Well, that water that they grabbed from the Atlantic Ocean has all these things in it that aren't normally found in the Great Lakes. And it could be anything from little critters to types of plants to uh, uh, clams, mussels. And the what happens is, is that once they're introduced, they don't have any natural predators because it's not their normal habitat. And so they just literally spread like wildfire and take over and dominate and squeeze out what's normally there. This has been a huge issue in the Great Lakes for many years. Um, I think, I don't know if they've, what they've all done for it, but uh, it's been a huge issue. Um, uh, one of the things that's oddly enough not on here is what's called a zebra mussel, and that's one of the biggest ones. 
So those were probably brought in in the belly of a ship somewhere. And now they've like, it's just they're everywhere in the Great Lakes to the point where they're choking out specific, you know, normal, natural species of plants and some animals. They just squeeze and dominate and you know, take over. So, <laughs> so this picture, it, it requires a little bit of uh, explanation. So that is what's called the Australian cane toad. Now, the Australian cane toad was introduced from, uh, it's a toad normally found in in um, South America, and they brought it to Australia to um, take care of, I think, a, a beetle problem, if I remember correctly. Now, there's a link on this slide that you can click on, and there's a website that kind of explains everything that happened with that. So, a long story short, they introduced this toad to take care of one problem, but the other problem is that the toad had no natural predators, and in fact, emits some type of neurotoxin which um, makes it so literally nothing can eat it and th they're everywhere this picture only shows one i saw pictures of just they're everywhere on the roads and it, it's a real problem in parts of australia and the problem yeah i mean you know it's a problem for many reasons one of them is it takes a lot of money to clean this stuff up okay Think about those those plants that I mentioned that are invasive species now in the Great Lakes. You got to keep those in check, or they'll clog up shipping lanes. They'll clog up everything, and you just you got it costs a lot of money from trying to keep these areas from being invaded by these invasive species. So that's that's what we mean by allowing the natural biodiversity to flourish. Is to just you know try not to <laughs> mess with what's already there. Okay, so you, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, give, bringing the toad in to take care of the beetle, and now the toads are the bigger of the two problems. Another uh, facet of uh, sustainability, and again, we're going to talk about this a lot. There's a whole chapter on this later in the semester, is the population growth of the earth. I mean, the more people you have, the harder it is to do everything to sustain them. You have to be able to sustain the population. And that's that's a problem when you got 7.3 billion people on Earth now. So we're going to take a look at a couple of little facets of that. Again, we got a whole chapter on this. I'm just kind of, this is sort of the glossing over part right now. So you can see in the chart here that in 1500 AD, there was only 425 million people roughly on Earth. And now if you see today, there's 7.3 billion. So there's many reasons for this. Um, part, a lot of it is, you know, the Industrial Revolution and better health care and all of these types of things that um, allow populations to just explode like that. Now, it has it has kind of tapered down a little bit in terms of how fast it's going um china has a big part in that you know having over a billion people themselves they've put limits on the number of kids you can have and stuff like that um in this country there's people having fewer kids because of you know working families things like that you know economics um so i mean there's a lot of reasons why it exploded and then there's other reasons why it might have been curtailed a little bit. Now with all these people, you have to feed them. You had to clothe you have to clothe them. You have to, you know, all of these, you know, basic needs need to be met when you and when you have that many people, it gets tough to do. On top of that, the bulk majority of humans on this earth now are starting to concentrate in large cities as opposed to rural areas. So that creates its own issues in terms of sustainability. You have, you know, just look at LA, right? You have all those people in LA and what do they get? Smog, you know, they have smog. So there you have a lot of people in one area. They all drive cars, There's, you know, there is mass transit, but if you've ever been to that area of the world, it's massive, meaning LA is one, you know, and it's not just LA, it's LA and all the suburbs. I was there a long time ago and it took two hours of driving before there was no more city. It was, it's just massive. So, you know, you have all of these things that play a role in how sustainability needs to be looked at 
be looked at down the road when you have 7.3 billion people that need to be sustained. So why is our population growing so quickly? And I just mentioned some of this, but I'll go over it again. They have the ability to expand in all climate zones and habitats. You know, we're the only ones that can do that on Earth. You're not going to find alligators in Canada, nor at least not natively. It's too cold. You know, you're not going to find polar bears in Florida. You know, it's just not going to happen. But humans, on the other hand, can adapt and pretty much live everywhere. And we've pretty much shown that on this this whole planet. I mean, there's people that live on all all six continents, but there are researchers that live in Antarctica much of the year. Um, so, you know, we're able to adapt both in a climate and habitat uh, anywhere on Earth. Modern agriculture has made food very, very efficient to grow and in large quantities. So, you know, especially in our country, right? You, there, you go to the supermarket, there's just tons of food. There's food everywhere. There's food in all the supermarkets. So America has an overabundance of options when it comes to food. So that helps feed our population and allow it to grow. Now the death rates decreased because of improved sanitation and healthcare. So you think back to the 1800s, you know, they have outhouses and, you know, doctors were far and few between in the wild west, for example. So you're, you're, uh, life expectancy was very short now it's i forgot what it is but it's getting up there it's in the 70s now early 70s i think and so the global global population excuse me is about 1.3 percent but it's slowing um and most of that again is in developing countries because people have a tendency to say hey we don't need to have 15 kids um you know they they or there's restrictions on them, like in, in China, you can only have one, I think, right now, just to kind of make sure there's enough to go around, so to speak. So there's a lot of things that play a role in why the, the, the population grew so quickly. But two of the big ones is the, the agriculture and then the access to health care. So what are the impacts of a growing population? Again, we're going to talk all about this quite a bit later on in uh, uh, its own chapter. But... You know, most of the world lives in developing countries. You know, we're we're in America and we are a developed nation. So we have infrastructure, we have hospitals and healthcare, and you know, we have everything here. Well, not everywhere has that. All right, we forget that sometimes. So, um, but the problem is, is we as developed countries consume more resources. Okay, we're. I mean, everybody knows that America is a throwaway country. I mean, we throw, you know. Our TV breaks, we don't fix it anymore. You go get a new one. It's that kind of thing, right? And then there's this little formula called the iPad equation, which is in population times affluence times technology, all right? So as a population grows, it needs to meet the if people. There's a video link that I, I, I don't remember if I linked it or not, explaining what the iPad uh, equation is. And it's sort of a, a basis to show where you are in the society in terms of sustainability because the higher the population is not the only thing affluence also means that you have more like in our country right i just mentioned we're consumers we use a lot we consume a lot that's where the affluence comes in there's not there's poverty here but there's not abject poverty like let's say in some of those countries in africa where you know they barely have enough food to eat and then you multiply that, by, multiply that by technology, which makes our lives easier, right? Easier. And uh, what that does is that allows you to consume more. Everything's there at, for the taking. We have cars. That's technology. Somebody had to, you know, we have cell phones. Those cell phones are made with all kinds of elements, sometimes really rare ones. So we're consuming rare elements or in our phones, you know, and then you got food. We eat a lot of food. <laughs> we have lots of choices in America for food. So all of these things play a role in that iPad equation and gives you sort of a basis as to where you are as, a, let's say, a country uh, in terms of your population and why, why it might be going up or down. So regardless, as we are growing as a world, 
and as the population grows you need, you have to be able to use uh, get the resources for that growing population things like land use and then sanitation and one of the big ones i mentioned earlier is access to clean water you know we take that for granted especially here in the great lakes region but in other parts of the world clean water is hard to come by okay it's just you know there's places like in india and bangladesh and stuff like that you know the sewer and the water are indistinguishable they're the same thing and that sounds gross but it's just the truth okay so all hopefully what you can see is that you know there's a lot going on in terms of why we are where we are so you have this population growth uh, explosion in the last hundred years or so we've had you know obviously health care and sanitation is better we've had we have more access uh, to food you know the, the the food the agriculture business is very efficient nowadays they're very good at what they do all right all of these things play a role in a growing population so i did set the links here i i uh, these are links they're actually all on the same page um but i just put them separately if you don't want to watch all of them um this is the, the definition of su sustainability none of these are super long i think the planetary boundaries one is 17 minutes but the other two are five six seven minutes take a look at them listen you know i uh, the ipad thing will probably come back to later in, in the semester a little bit um but take a look at these and uh see how they work the planetary boundary ones sort of a plenary speech that this gentleman gave it's embedded in the website for the book all three of these are sort of the website for the book that you're using that's where i got them got these from so go ahead and take a look at them and you know it'll help reinforce what some of these ideas are um, going forward all right that's it for chapter one uh i'm i know i'm a little behind but we're getting there we're getting there I got the discussion questions up there i still got to make quizzes and stuff like that and uh I'm going to get going on chapter two right away. Chapter two is a little bit shorter, though. I kind of condense some things. So, all right, we'll see you in chapter two.